Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to our full council meeting on Wednesday, the 15th of November, 2023. I'll run through the emergency procedures first before we go on to the agenda. In case of emergency, there are no planned fire drills during this meeting. If you hear the fire alarm sound, please treat it as a real emergency and evacuate the building via the nearest safe escape route. The nearest escape route is via the stairs to your left as you leave the council chamber or public gallery. Exit by the door at the back of the building and walk across the inner car park to the evacuation point, which is the pavement opposite the police station. The large wooden doors entrance exit onto the high street will be locked from 6 p.m. tonight due to bad weather conditions. Is that true? <laughs> the lift can't be used in the event of emergency. Please do not re-enter the building until your advice is safe to do so by a member of staff. I would like to advise both members of the public and press this meeting is being recorded and broadcast live. Mobile phones should be switched off unless they're being used for the meeting. Please only speak when I ask you to do so and speak clearly into the microphone. Before I move on to the agenda, I, um, I've got apologies from some of the councillors, uh, Councillor Brading, Councillor Ellis, Councillor Jones Evans, Councillor Love, Councillor Medland, Councillor Redrup. Are there any more apologies I've missed? The other one, yeah, Sarah Redrup. And I've also got some announcements of past councillors that have sadly passed away. So I've got notification of Councillor Ada Lee, who was a ward councillor for Cows Council Ward from 1985 to 1995, and then from 95 to 2001 after Unitary, and also the passing of Councillor Peter Brand, who was our MP as well, and he served from the early 80s to mid 90s. And I, I know that um, some people want to speak about that. So if you want to speak at either of those councillors, then I'm um, pleased to hear. Councillor Garrett. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'd, I'd, I'd like to speak of Peter Brand. Um, Peter came known to me I, in the early 80s because of his very distinctive Brand X posters, uh, which helped him towards his first election victory in Braiding in 19, 1984, and he stayed on, on the council until 1997, serving as, as, as deputy leader of the, count, of the council in, in that time, as well as being a, a very popular local, local GP through that time. 1997, um, he was elected to the House of Commons um, uh, as the member of parliament for the Isle of Wight, and, and um, amongst Amongst the things that he did there was to be the party's um, house spokes, spokesperson. But you can find out all of those sorts of things by by googling Peter. What, what you can't find about Peter is what we heard in an incredibly beautiful eulogy from his sons uh, of the person, the father, the husband, the the doctor. Um, he, he was just so clearly a man who's absolutely dedicated to his family, uh, to his community, to his patients. He, he led a life of of of, of, of unswerving service to our other people. Um, my last memory of Peter uh, was, however, uh, one that was very, one I, I, I do remember very fondly because like my grandmother, he owned an MG sports car. And I did get to drive, not in the car as, as, as the driver, unfortunately, but be a passenger with him. But in that, that, that short drive, uh, both experiencing the thrill of, of, of an MG sports car, which uh, I, I, I particularly love, not that I'm that much of a petrol head, but also Peter was very, very encouraging to me in the first time that I was standing for Isle of Wight Council when I uh, wasn't quite successful. Um, I think the fine thing I'd want to say about Peter is summed up best actually to what my, my colleague, Councillor Nick Stewart, said when I invited people to to um, send through any things that they remembered of, of Peter. And, and that was that he was a thoroughly decent man. And what more could we ask of anybody to remember us as being thoroughly decent? Thank you, Councillor Garrett. Um, 
Councillor PC Wilcox. Um, yes, I wasn't expecting to speak, but um, I, I'm very heartened to. I was deeply saddened uh, at the news um, of, of Councillor Ada Lee. She was, um, I suppose, really, she was um, a, a bit of a mentor for me, particularly when I joined Cows Town Council 25 years ago. Um, and she was an incredible mentor. She was extremely principled to the point of standing down from the party she represented when she had um, really strong views. So um, perhaps that's where I get some of my, my, my uh, fire from. But she was an absolutely superb lady. She was extremely committed to the Cows Community Club, the old Plessy Club. Um, and she, did, she, did, she worked tirelessly there for the people. And, you know, Ada was quite, I would say, posh, but she was she was there for absolutely everybody in the town. Everybody knew her. She was walking around. She was always really proactive about housing for people. Um, and she was just absolutely um, wonderful. And I'm so glad she led such a lovely, long and very good life um, right near till the end. Um, and, yeah, she was a really big loss for cows. She was an incredible woman. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fuller. Thank you. I'm also going to pay testament to the lovely Ada Lee. Um, Ada um, encouraged me to stand as a county councillor back in 1995, worked very, very closely with Ada. Ada was incredibly passionate about planning. Um, we we worked together on the planning uh, on the early days of the planning committee, and although we didn't always see eye to eye, I think we fully understood each other and wherever we we came from. Coincidentally, both Ada and myself lost um, lost our seats in the two thousand and one election, and we spent quite a lot of time chatting about um, a, a, about planning and how things should be done, not how they were done. And I think she was very very uh, vocal concerning that. And I know that during the First two terms of uh, of, of um, the uh, the the Isle of Wight Council, um, how meticulous she was on the new planning policy that we were trying to adopt at that time. I remember her chairing the meetings and reading everything through line by line with other members of the planning committee. And other councillors would would probably get bored after a while, but Ada was always there. And I know when we went to the public inspection. Um, she was she was there fighting for the island and her community at that time. She was an absolutely fantastic um, councillor. I think she was absolutely gob gobsmacked when I moved back to Cowes again. And um, I returned to the Isle of Wight Council in 2009. Um, and we, we carried on our friendship from there. So um, although we sat on different sides, sides of the chamber, she was an absolute... Um, God sent to me. She was a fantastic lady and uh, a very, very sad loss to, to the island. Thank you. Councillor Nicholson. Uh, in, in endorsement of my two colleagues from Cowes, um, Ada Lee was recognised as, a, as a, a powerhouse. She was a remarkable woman, um, tireless in her energy and in her influence. Um, and uh, uh, she lived a very long uh, and and productive life um she succeeded by her children and one of her children was a cows town councillor following in her footsteps but uh she commands even uh the mention of her name now in cows enormous respect and i think that you know it's right that she, her passing should be marked uh with honor Thank you. Thanks for all those those nice words. And, you know, it's nice to remember those that served before us. OK, moving on to our agenda. On to item one is the minutes. So um, is everybody happy with the minutes? If you can raise your hand, please. Thank you. That's voted through. I've just signed those minutes. Item two, the declarations of interest. Has anybody got anything they would wish to raise? No, nope, looks like we've got no interest tonight. Okay. And on to item three, public questions. So I have some 
written questions, but I'm happy to go to the public gallery first for oral questions. Is there any? No, no notice of any. Welcome to everybody in the public gallery anyway. Nice to see you. And um, so we will go straight on to the submit pre submitted qu questions, which are. Yep, they are. So we have received a question for Mr. and Mrs. Kinnard. Would they like to read their question out to everybody? Or I'm happy to if if needed. Hello. Hello. Um, I live on Honey Hill, which has become really dangerous to cross. Um, the, the pavement's very narrow up there, both sides, uh, until you get down, you know, farther down the hill. The traffic that comes up there now is amazing, and we get many, many people actually speeding up there. It's, it's just goes, they just go far too fast. Um, we have a crossing sort of college end of the hill, which is at the top, hill, uh, top end of the hill, and there is crossing at the bottom. For myself to be able to get from one side of the road to the other, I have to go down to the bottom of the hill, across one crossing, second, and then the third, then walk up the hill again. So we're just wondering what can be done um, to reduce the speed of the traffic, because it, like I say, it's become so dangerous. It's just an accident waiting to happen there, trying to cross from one side to the other. The people that live up there, um, many are elderly, many are young families with children. They try pushing prams and pushchairs up there, but the pavements are so narrow. If you get a pushchair on that pavement, there's little space for the child they're walking to school mainly to walk beside them. They either have to walk in front or behind. Um, and if that child was to slip off the pavement, then you know, with the traffic going so fast, it is very, very dangerous at the minute. We're just wondering what you can suggest that could be done, sort of as an immediate, um, you know, to resolve the issue, really. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your question. I think uh, the Councillor Jordan has prepared a response and he will answer that for you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, and uh, well, we will provide this response, Chair. But I, but I think it might be in order to to read it out. So please bear with me. And and thank you very much for your request. And, and we do appreciate uh, the concerns that you've raised. And it's worth noting for the public and for councillors that the Isle of Wight Council, either direct or via our highway service provider received many such requests uh, and concerns on a daily basis uh, regarding locations across the island. Therefore, the requests, just, just like others received, are forwarded uh, to Island Roads as our highway service provider for assessment by the road safety engineer for inclusion on the highway safety and improvement register. So this assessment will include an initial desktop evaluation uh, of the location based on their extensive knowledge of the local highway network. Available traffic statistics, including previous surveys where they ex uh, exist, the current road conditions, so that's things like uh, the speed limit, the traffic regulation orders, and road traffic collision statistics. This will determine an initial score, which will indicate if it is a priority for the Isle of Wight Council as a local highways authority to consider for improvement. And as you've uh, alluded to, the majority and the, the, the complexity of the location and its use by the public uh, may result in more than one single improvement proposal some of which may require designs that be developed uh, and uh, will require public consultations for those designs. Until the outcome of that assessment and any assessment is known, we're not able to advise as to whether an improvement in this location is a priority or any 
potential time scales. As again, any recommended improvements will have to be further considered against other known priority schemes. Other priority schemes such as the uh, A3056 uh, within the Safer Roads project. The A0356 is essentially the main road through Ariton from Sandown to Blackwater and on to Newport. Uh, and uh, which has been that's been identified as a national road safety priority and grant funded. Uh, in the meantime, we will request, we shall request a further survey of the traffic at this location um, uh, and to better understand the current traffic conditions to help inform that assessment. So. So in, in broad terms, we will look at the, the, the problem that you've brought up. We'll, we will correctly assess it, uh, use the data that we have, and then see where that fits in terms of how we spend our limited resources on a call right across the island for safety concerns. So I hope that gives you some comfort and some information. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. We also have a question from Benson Hardy from our Youth Council. Is Benson here? Is anyone going to? Oh, oh, Adam, my my read. Oh, Olivia Metcalf and Leanne are going to ask the question. Thank you. Hi, I'm Olivia. I'm representing the Isle of Wight Youth Council. We want to know what are the council's plans to raise the academic achievements of young people on the Isle of Wight. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. Councillor Bacon's got uh, an answer for you. Thank you very much and thank you for the question. Um, and I'd like to thank Benson in particular for identifying what in the, the maelstrom of comment and opinion that has been circulating in recent months is the real question that should be being considered and indeed the key issue whenever we talk about schools. Whatever other issues or influences there might be, it is of fundamental importance that we focus on the education standards and achievements of our young people. With that in mind, I would like to thank our head teachers and school staff for all their relentless hard work in this regard. However, picking up on your question, it is clear that whilst we have made progress, there is a lot more to do. If we are not the best, we can do better. Education standards are comparative and not about absolute measures. The education of our young people is too important for there to be any element of complacency and certainly too important for any other issues to be given primacy in the thought and planning that takes place when talking about schools. Obviously, we are in a time of change in the management of our education system on the island. As such, we will have the opportunity for further review and injection of new ideas in the new year. But as to current work, targeted education pro projects took place last year, led by our school improvement colleagues, and they did achieve strong results with much steeper improvement trajectories than national results. Revised versions of those projects, enhanced uh, following feedback, will be delivered through the current year and will have a sharp focus on increasing academic achievement and supporting leadership development work. Schools are also being encouraged to access resources provided by the DfE, Department of Education, funded phonics and maths hubs. There will be more to come and all of this activity is aimed at supporting our schools to achieve the very best for all our island children. But can I also say, while I've got the opportunity, um, as I thank Benson for the question, I would very much uh, like the opportunity to meet with Benson, yourselves and other youth council colleagues. Um, having recently stepped into the children's services role, I'm aiming to speak to as many stakeholders as possible and I would value the opportunity to hear your views on education, as well as other issues of concern and interest to you, as I'm sure you have a lot to say and, con and contribute to the debate that is going on. Thank you. Thank you. Was there any supplementary question? No? Okay. 
Moving on to item four is the chairman's official announcement. So I'll just give you a roundup of what I have attended in the last couple of months, which has included uh, the Best Kept Village Awards, several citizenship ceremonies. I've had the pleasure to um, officiate at uh, the Steam Railway Celebration Day with the vice chair and other councillors. Girl guiding visit to the County Hall. I've been to Bryston Primary School for their multi faith week. And also, obviously, this last week attended a lot of remembrance parades, which I'm sure you'll have as well, which has been good to be part of the community at that time. Um, I have the Isle of Wight Council Christmas card design has been judged and will be announced next week. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend the Adult Learning Awards uh, last evening, but thank you to those councillors that did attend to support those who had achieved awards. And I would also like to use this opportunity to just say thanks again to all those in the community that have helped out during the ongoing bad weather that we have. The Isle of Wight is suffering some of the, the heaviest rainfall we've seen for um, a long time, and many of the rivers and waterways are still struggling to cope with that with the homes and flooded, the roads closed and many people affected. So um, acknowledging those that have gone over and above in our community to help others and just saying that that's, that assistance really appreciated by many people. So that's it really, that's all from me. And I will move on to item five. So that is the leaders update, please. That's the Jordan, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. I won't take any of the time up of this council. Uh, the leaders report you have. Um, I would just be adding to the words written there if I spoke about it. So I'm happy to provide it to you uh, and we'll do uh, each full council meeting in future and happy to take any questions on it uh, as required. Questions? Any questions? No? <laughs> oh, Councillor Lilly. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jordan. Um, I welcome your highlighting World Mental Health Day uh, and your attendance along with me at the staff event uh, on that day. One of the successes in promoting positive um, positive mental health projects has been uh, this your administration's public health funding of a mental health grant supporting over 30 projects which um, have really sort of changed people's lives uh, quite dramatically uh, across the island. Can the leader ensure that this grant fund will continue in 2024-25? Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, I would love to say, can I confirm it will continue? I can't. And the reason being that the grant, but the funding for public health has not been awarded for next year. Uh, and so therefore, uh, it would be wrong of me to uh, guarantee any spend at this time in public health. I would say, as you know, that public health receives a, a, a budget to deliver all of its services, and there is some leeway on the behalf of the director of public health uh, to make decisions about how that spend is made. So I would hope that he would look favourably on maintaining uh, support for mental health services. No more questions to the leader. We can move on to item six, which is the report of the monitoring officer. I'll pass over to Mr Potter. I believe there is one change to the list, but other than that, it's been agreed. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and, and good evening. Um, yes, members have had a revised uh, appointments uh, appendix circulated. Uh, there is one amendment to that uh, revised list. Uh, and that is in respect of a vacancy which has arisen since uh, you've been issued the uh, appendix. Uh, Pension Fund Committee, uh, Councillor Paul Fuller 
uh, to replace Councillor Claire Critchison on the Pension Fund Committee, uh, with Claire Critchison being moved to the substitute list for the Pension Fund Committee. Uh, those are the wishes notified to me uh, by the uh, leader of uh, the Alliance Group. Um, you have the information in front of you, members, as to the vacancies which uh, have been notified. Uh, and I would invite uh, uh, members to consider that. And the recommendation is that the appointments set out in Appendix 1, as revised and as updated, uh, be agreed. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr Potter. Could I have a seconder for that? Councillor Mosdell, thank you. So is everybody in agreement with that? If you um, uh, would agree, then <laughs> hand up. Thank you. Anyone against that? Any abstentions? I think there's oh, one. Councillor Brody, is that abstention? Yeah, one abstention. Thank you. Just comment. This is a far more sensible way of doing this rather than the dragging out, the tireless dragging out that we had to suffer in previous councils. And whoever's idea it was, I think I'd like to thank them for it. Yeah, Councillor Jordan. Sorry, I won't extend, but, but uh, thank you, John. Uh, and thanks to the group leaders that made this happen this way, uh, Claire, Jeff, Richard, Andrew and Chris, uh, that made this happen. So it's come in this way, agreed before we got here. Thank you for all of you for contributing and making it happen. I think it has tried to happen in the past, but I think everyone's realised quite how painful it had been. So it is appreciated that it could be agreed in advance. So. I'm glad we could confirm that and um, that is uh, now updated that list until the next meeting. On to item seven, it's another report from the leader, which is executive appointments. This is just for noting. Um, so I don't believe we have to vote on this one. Mr Potter. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Obviously, uh, following the change in leader uh, of the Cabinet Leader of the Council, uh, executive appointments have been made uh, by the uh, Leader of the Cabinet. And as the Chairman has rightly mentioned uh, to you this evening, that the list of executive appointments, which is a matter solely for the Leader of the Cabinet, has been um, put before uh, full Council, uh, merely to note and that uh, you can formally note it uh, uh, by affirmation if you so wish or by vote if you so wish. Uh, but the appointments have been made by the leader of the cabinet. Thank you. I think Councillor Brodie wants to uh, speak, Chair. Councillor Brodie. Yeah, it's just a question, Chair. I'm just interested as to who and when the decisions are made for organisations that we appoint people to. Because I don't believe I've ever seen any decision by this full council in quite a number of years that we would send people to, for instance, and I think it's something that I am increasingly interested in, the mysterious local government association, who, from my point of view, are non-existent. Um, now, people will no doubt disagree with me, but I've never seen a report back from it ever in 18 and a half years. I wonder what benefit there is. I do know that it costs us a lot of money to affiliate every year. Somebody might be able to remind me, but I know it's at least five figures, potentially nearer six figures. Now, I'm a great believer in working with other organisations or other people, but they have to be effective. And I'm not sure that the LGA is effective. Thank you. Um, Mr Potter, do you know when we agree these bodies and, and why and whether they need to be revisited? Thank you, Chair. Um, obviously, I, I can't comment on, on the point which uh, Councillor Brodie has made specifically. Um, I can say that obviously as a matter of best practice, uh, it is sensible that uh, these matters are reviewed periodically in terms of whether appointments or whether nominations and indeed the outcomes, the benefits for belonging to various bodies, whether they be national, uh, regional or, or local. 
Um, so uh, those will take part. Uh, we will look at the various bodies, um, both which are executive appointments and also appointments for council, and just check the relevance of it. Uh, but obviously, uh, I think it's appreciated that I, as an officer, cannot comment on the particular uh, point, but no doubt uh, one or two members might wish to do so. Thank you. I'd have supplementary. I think the leader wanted to say something which may be helpful, but then I may, I'd like to come back. Uh, th th thank you, Jeff. Uh, I I'm happy to say that we will have a look at all of those outside bodies uh, in a fairly loose, informal way and, 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 and provide some kind of report back at a future date, if you bear with us on that in terms of capacity. But happy to look at all of those. I, I agree, Jeff. Um, they've come up over years and years, some of these, and we just uh, put people on them and send people away. Councillor Churchman goes up to London on behalf of myself on parking, uh, which I always find quite amusing because it's called patrol, which is parking outside of London and the meetings are inside of London. But there, there, there we are. Uh, happy to look at them, Jeff. Councillor Brody, a supplementary. All, all I would ask, Chair, I would ask Councillor Jordan if having undertaken that review, that at least they're brought to all members at some point. I'm not saying, you know, every year or anything like that, but I think we probably should just look at them occasionally to see what value the council taxpayer gets from all of this, because it's not just the affiliation, but it's also all the costs as well, you know, uh, affiliated, sending people off there, etc. And at this time when money is tight, and might be somewhere where money could be saved. Thank you very much. And and also possibly provide a crossing on Honey Hill and many other roads in the town that I am pleased to represent. Thank you. Get that in, Jeff. <laughs> We're doing our best on crossings, Jeff. I will. I'll commit to having a look at. Um, I'll commit to having a look at these these bodies. I absolutely agree with you that some of some of them cost us money. We're in a financial constraints, and we need to look at that to see if we uh, it, it, what we gain from having membership and sending councillors to them. Absolutely, look at that, Jeff, and come back. Thank you. I think it is important because a lot of them are a mystery to me and I, I don't know what the, the point of them are, so it would be good to revisit it. Councillor Mosdell. Thank you. Um, I take on board completely what Councillor Brody says. Um, as most of these positions are because of a cabinet role with a particular portfolio, can we request in the interim that anybody who is attending these meetings does an actual report themselves to the relevant committees? Um, it, it would be good for us to actually see what the combined fire authorities latest meeting is happening and, the, and if a report is actually just a quick report is done to the relevant committees then we can see for ourselves one that the person's attended and actually that maybe they've stayed awake for it so it probably is quite relevant if they've been able to do a report so just following up on that so they've never had reports before in the time i mean obviously i'm fairly new to this so i so you've never had to do reports so yeah, but yeah i think it's Good idea to revisit why, why we're doing some of those. Councillor Andre. Thank you. I don't really want to contradict, but I did recently submit a report from a webinar that I attended that was actually um, a relatively small cost. And I might be wrong, but I think I was the first councillor to actually submit a report. And I am concerned that our democratic services are under pressure. So I think we do need to be mindful. Having said that, I think there is no harm in circulating to councillors, perhaps minutes of a meeting, but I'm very mindful that we don't want to put any extra pressure on our staff who are already under pressure. Thank you. Councillor Fuller. It's just really a question, Chairman. I know that a few years ago, under the last administration, um, there was a request mid-term mid for us to provide reports. That never happened again, but I think there was a single single um, request that, that was made. Um, you know, I do report about um, uh, the, the meetings I attend with SIPCA and um, the SONE Forum, um, and I'm quite happy to... Um, 
copy and paste what I've written within my reports um, to the wider membership of the Isle of Wight Council. I think it's it's good practice probably to do it. If I can find the time to do it, then I'd be more than happy to, to do that. But yeah, there are a lot of important things that are going on there. This morning, I was at a meeting uh, uh, where I met with the chief executive of um, Southern Water, and we were talking about um, Southern Water's um, so-called investment um, locally. So they are very, very important meetings. And I think it's very, very important that we get, actually get around the table and actually meet meet with these people. But I would be very more more than happy to write a regular an, annual report on, on what I do. Yep. Uh, Councillor Mosdale. Thank you. I think one of the things that all the group leaders agreed with when we were doing this list that um, and we put the LGA position to Councillor Reggiani is because actually she's one of the few councillors, if she goes anything, does anything, we all get an all members email to inform us and update us. So, you know, thank you. Your communication with the rest of us is absolutely fantastic. Um, so we're not talking going to democratic services, just a quick email to say, I've been, this is what happened, is actually it doesn't need to take up any officer time. You know, it is the responsibility of those councillors. You know, you've got a glowing example over there of what good should look like. So let's try and follow and carry on what the good work that she's doing, please. Thank you, Claire. Just checking how I deal with that one because um, so is everybody happy with that report as it's for noting and that we go forward with looking into that those positions. Just a show of hands just so that we've put it through the room. Anyone against or abstaining on that? Councillor Brodie's abstaining. Thank you. So I, I know it's a bit early. I have put in maybe a comfort break at this point before we go on to the motions, but I feel like we could probably just keep going. Yeah, I'm just I'm just putting it out there because I think it's thinking of anybody that um, would want to do that. So we are going straight on to the motions. We don't normally get through things quite so so swiftly, which is very good. Mikey, Jeff, I'm not sure I'm capable of doing that. Um, <laughs> give it, give it a whirl. Yeah. <laughs> right, the, the clock's on. OK, so we're on mo item eight, motion. Councillor Stevens. Thank you. I'm using my microphone and if and I'm, this is not a criticism because we all, uh, you know, make the sides and what have you, but could you use the microphone? Because I missed all, the, all, all of that, Jeff, and uh, I'd like to have heard it and I'd laugh along with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevens. I don't think it was an official announcement. So um, on to item eight, the motions. I've, I've got the first one here. Uh, 8A is a motion from Councillor Lilly. And I, I've let this, it's quite a long motion, Councillor Lilly. I've allowed this on here and I will come to Councillor Brody in a moment. <laughs> um, but um, I, I've allowed you to have this on here because it's quite a long motion, but I wanted to know a little bit more about it. So that has helped helped me understand that. But I know when you come to it, you, you won't read it all out entirely for us. But um, OK, I've got Councillor Brodie wants to speak first. Just very quickly, a, po a point of order. And I made the same point uh, at, a, at a previous meeting when Councillor Bacon had the longest motion in the history of the Isle of Wight Unitary <laughs> Council, which everybody agreed with, and most of them have walked away and ignored it ever since. But um, once again, we have a motion here that is ridiculously long. So what I would suggest is if you're insisting on being verbose in writing, can you be very short in your proposal? And this is particularly to the proposer of this motion, who generally overruns time. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> Noted, Councillor Brody. I had made that point in advance. So, and, and I know um, you've you've done a, a similar um, motion before. But yours was 
yours was quite short and I, I think I personally needed a little bit more about this this important subject so I think there's finding that happy medium and I think yes I would like them to be slightly shorter in the future but um, if it keeps the the uh, preamble a little bit shorter that would be very um, grateful thank you councillor Lilly I think the motion um, chair uh, speaks for itself so I'm obviously not going to read it out but it was it's an important principle because it, this motion was actually presented to me and i'm I, it was important that i feel that it was printed because it was very much the solent and island waspies um wanted to put the history on uh forward on that so thank you for printing it uh, the solent women against state pension inequality which is called waspy is part of the national and international and local campaign. They approached me to, sub to submit this motion and a many of the uh, practically uh, there is a member of WASP in every ward of this uh, island and in fact um, a number of those are actually represented uh, in the gallery. Uh, with that and including um, members who actually live in my own ward of Ride Apley. So they represent Swasi women in, uh, across the island and I'm speaking on their behalf. There are over 11,000 plus women born in the 1950s and on the island and they are a group of residents faced with the reality of this injustice. They have been campaigning for state pension justice since 2015. In 2016, Isla White was one of the first councils in the UK to pass a motion supporting this campaign for justice, and it was proposed by Councillor Jeff Brodie. Seven years on, they are still fighting to be heard by the government and fighting for fair treatment. It is a sad fact that our residents, along with all women across the UK, are still waiting for justice. So it's right and proper Isla White Council revisits this issue and reconfirms its support it made in 2016. We cannot allow this injustice to be brushed under the carpet. All of us here will be related to a woman who was born in the 1950s. All of us will speak to a woman daily that was born in the 1950s. They are not invisible, they are real and need our support and they are also up in the gallery. As part of their campaigning strategy, many of them lodge complaints of maladministration against the Department of Work and Pensions and in July 2021, they were vindicated by a parliamentary and health service ombudsman, finding that maladministration had occurred in the way the DWP failed to inform them that they would have to wait up to a further six years for their state pension. The ombudsman encouraged the government to be proactive in resolving this issue, but they still wait. Since their campaign started in 2015, more than 248,000 1950s women have died without seeing justice. Nationally, one WASPy women, right, including on the island, dies every 50 minutes waiting for compensation. This is shocking, sad and totally avoidable. Solent Waspy and Isla White women, including residents in my ward, have given numerous examples of hardship endured by local Waspy women struggling to cope with thousands of pounds shortfall in expected state pensions. They recall the women in a woman in health with anguish etched on her face as she wondered how she could cope with another six years in her physically demanding cleaning job. Another widowed in her early 50s had expected to retire at 60. She planned accordingly, thinks she'll be able to just about manage. 
Forced to downsize, she had to return to work in a care home to make ends meet. She had not anticipated the cost, the current cost of living crisis, which has brought new fear and anxiety. One of the WASPy women suffered severe mental health consequences after finding out by chance that she would not, she would have to wait another six years for her state pension. All her retirement plans were ruined. I urge you to support this motion because of 11,000 women born in the 1950s. Uh, we deserve to give their support. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Emily. I'm coming back on to Councillor Quirk first. He's got a point of order. Why is a point of order? Uh, we have two resolutions here. It says we resolve twice. Can we take it that the second resolution is the actual resolution, that the, it's only the last five lines that is actually the resolution? Yeah, that's that's correct, Councillor Quirk. Uh, Councillor Jordan's going to second that motion. Would you like to speak on it, Councillor Jordan? Oh, just very briefly. OK. Uh, th uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you for the women in the gallery that have, that have brought this to our attention. Uh, just to help. Uh, and comfort those people in the gallery and for us as councillors in here, uh, as I understand it and pointed out by Councillor Quirk, that I'm being asked to uh, write to the Member of Parliament uh, and to the Secret Secretary of State for Work and Pensions. I'm very happy to do so if that helps uh, Councillor Lilly and helps the people in the public gallery uh, and would do so within the next few days, uh, perhaps within the next week or so, uh, not, not or so, within the next week, I will I will write that. Now, if that helps you to uh, make a decision on this, I, I'm glad uh, and please take that into account. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak on that? Are you happy to? I propose we go to the vote on that basis, Chair. OK, Councillor Brodie um, would like to speak. Yeah, just very quickly, Chair. Uh, yes, I, I did propose that uh, a very short motion seven years ago, more than seven years ago regarding the WASPy women after it had been brought to attention by my wife's sister, who was one of the affected ones. I had no idea about it at the time. Um, the motion was led to a letter, as I recall at the time, being sent. Well, I don't think there was ever any reply or, or a, a such like, um, or anything helpful whatsoever to the WASPy women. I entirely support their campaign. Sadly, I don't think it'll get anywhere because unless we have a change of government. But then yeah, I'm biased in that regard. Even then, such as the state of the national economy, I doubt if it would ever happen, sadly. But I will obviously support the motion as I did seven years ago. Thank you. <clears throat> so, Jarman. Could we request that? Uh... Uh, I, I think we're all very, very happy to endorse this, uh, but by the way. Uh, could we request that the letter, when it's sent, uh, is made public and goes on the Council website as well, and that we also request that any reply uh, that's received is also made public and put onto our website so that everybody can see full disclosure of that and that we can ensure that there is a reply to it and that we're all informed of what that reply is. Thank you. Uh, happy, happy to confirm all of those things. Okay, thank you. So um, everybody who is in agreement with that motion, would you raise your hands? Anyone against? Any abstentions? No, that motion's carried and thank you, Councillor to bring it forward. And thank you to those that have come in the public gallery. So thank you. On to Motion 8B. This one is from Councillor Stewart. So I'd over to you to speak on that one. Thank you, Councillor Brody. We'll be pleased to note that this is a slightly shorter motion. I hope others will appreciate it and have read it. It is clear that we have not seen the fabled island deal. I know that a lot of people on the island have made lots of effort to try and get it to happen. 
I've seen lots of promises from all sorts of politicians. We still see nothing. We see nothing in the levelling up bill, specifically referencing islands. And what we do see is, as is clear in the motion, that the economic disadvantages, the educational disadvantages and the social disadvantages of living on the island when we are not treated fairly are obvious to everybody. The motion stands. I would welcome everybody's support from it because there is no doubt that we can at least push the current government or any succeeding governments to start to consider us fairly. Thank you. For a seconder, Councillor Lilly, Councillor Jarman, would you like to speak on it? Oh, OK, sorry, I hadn't quite got to the asking it. The drama goes. Also, I thought you wanted to speak on it or a point of order or something. So. We're seconding the motion. Oh, okay, seconding the motion. Yeah. Councillor Jarman, second. Um, would you like to speak on that as seconder? No, I think we. It's it, this is something that the island has been long pursuing, and more importantly, is something that the island deserves. Councillor Jordan. For, forgive me, Councillor Stewart, but I'd like to propose a minor amendment. Uh, if I may, and I apologise that I didn't have time to do this before the meeting, uh, but it is very small. But um, at the end of the, uh, uh, after item three, it says the council will take, this is the motion as it stands, the, the council will take all steps necessary to pursue central government to deliver a fair outcome for the island. I, I would like to amend that to read the council will continue to take all steps necessary to pursue central government uh, uh, and look for a seconder on that. It's a small change, but it's an important one, I think. Councillor Brodie, are you happy to second that change? Yeah. Okay. Is Councillor Stewart accept it? <laughs> I'm just going to have it. Yeah. Stewart, you Entirely to... reasonable and sensible. As I made clear when I spoke, um, I am aware that a lot of people have put a lot of effort over many years to try and get a fair deal. Thank you. Councillor Jarma, are you happy as a second of that? Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak on that? Councillor Brodie. Just perhaps if we could just have some clarity regarding uh, the, the the opening paragraph at the the top of the page. Council believes a legislative solution would ensure that the Isle of Wight secures equitable treatment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That suggests that you're seeking some form of act of parliament, but you're not actually stating that in clear and and and, uh, and open terms. Is that what you're intending, Councillor Stewart? So Stuart? Happy to respond. Um, having worked in Whitehall, a single act of parliament may be insufficient. It may be that there is an island act, an island acts, islands act. There are a number of possibilities there. I would not seek to make a single legislative statement um, and therefore I wanted to leave it as open as possible so that the possibilities for the island are pursued in the best way uh, that, that would be appropriate. Master Quiggy? Uh, yes, I, I will support this motion, but I need to say that motions like this don't mean anything or do anything when we leave this chamber. It's, I, I'm not a fan of the blue team, but if anyone suggested to me that Dave Stewart hadn't tried to achieve this, I'd give him a mouthful. I'm not a member of the Alliance, and if anyone suggested that Laura hadn't tried to achieve this, I would give them a mouthful. And I don't have enough time or crayons to explain that every single councillor in this room wants fair funding for the island, wants a fair approach to cross-solent services, wants equality of health service, and guess what? The council, councils of various colours, have taken all necessary steps to pursue a fair outcome for the island. It's our MP that hasn't. So whilst I support this motion, 
I really would wish we'd start to do something that's meaningful for the people of the island. And with that in mind, can we just move to the vote? I agree. Yeah, I don't have any more speakers. So um, all those for this motion, raise your hands. Any against? And any abstentions? No, that motion is carried. Moving on to item 8C, I have a motion from Councillor Ian Dorr. So would you like to speak on this motion? Thank you very much, Chair. <clears throat> This motion is not a direct request for funds, nor is it about location, nor is it asking full council to run or put together Armed Forces Day. It is merely asking for a discussion, a discussion across the chamber that could lead to more positive outcomes for our island's armed forces community through Armed Forces Day. A discussion that could lead to a more robust approach in other areas of our commitment a discussion that could lead to a consideration in the budget setting process. We all have military connections on our patches, some in the chamber this evening, deep rooted personal connections. For example, Councillor Churchman, Councillor Ward, Councillor Morstall, Councillor Jordan, and the list goes on. In my position as Armed Forces Champion, I have seen what has been committed in the past and acting on behalf of the Armed Forces community. It's clear we're not doing quite enough but we could. Through the Armed Forces Covenant, we have made a commitment to the island's Armed Forces community. That's just shy of 16,000 individuals, over 11% of our total population. That's more than a city of Southampton's. As a side note, although Armed Forces Day caters for cadets, reservists, forces families, the highest proportion of island-based veterans live in Ryde, Seaview, Bembridge and the Nettleston areas. Tonight's consideration is one of how full council provides various levels of support whilst fulfilling its obligations as an armed covenant, armed forces covenant signatory. Our armed forces day this year was better attended than Portsmouth, yet their population is 66,000 higher than ours. The event inspires youth. It supports charities that in turn support our armed forces community. And it's great for our local economy, reputation and standing. It's signpost career paths, and by doing so, offers education, adventure, excitement, careers, friendship, and personal rewards. It flies the flag for cadets, reservists, and of course, veterans, many of whom we rightly bowed our heads for this weekend. It is an event that is bountiful in its offerings and is something we should be incredibly proud of. And we have a duty to support it. That duty, that obligation, is within the Armed Forces Covenant of which we are a signatory and a gold award holder. In my opinion, and the opinion of a great many others, this event should not incur any fees, such as, for example, council land hire and other admin related provision. And currently it does. As a signatory and supporter, through an agreement, any such elements should be gifted in the same way that hover travel and white link gift passage. And yes, both are proud covenant signatories nor should any financial contribution from full council go towards such expenditure. It should be used for entertainment, creating value and worth of the event. Any agreement should also give us power of veto to ensure that monies raised at the event, save for our partner charities, stay with the event to ensure future sustainability. This is vital. We must reaffirm our commitment, bringing it up to date in a way that is befitting to the stature of full council. The first duty of government is the defence of the realm. Our armed forces fulfil that responsibility on behalf of the government, sacrificing civilian freedoms, facing danger and sometimes suffering serious injury and death. In return, the whole nation has a moral obligation to the members of the forces together with their families. They deserve our respect, support and fair treatment. This is what the Armed Forces Covenant commits us to. This is why it's important to retain our gold status and this is why it's important to inspire, cultivate, assisting in the growth of this event, to demonstrate an unflinching commitment to the island's armed forces community. I ask members to discuss their views this evening and consider the value they put on this event, not simply for next year or the year after, but in years to come. In the same way that over the weekend, we honored 
a generation who stood fast on their commitment. So we have an obligation to deliver on ours. I thank you and I seek a seconder. Seconder, Councillor Quigley. Councillor Quigley, would you like to speak on that as seconder? I will, I will speak now, actually, and I'll be very brief, is that we quite often get accused of gesture politics as politicians, and this is an actual chance to do something that isn't just a gesture. It's something meaningful for the 16,000 16, service people that live on the island. And I think Councillor Dora has brought forward a very worthwhile motion. Okay, would anyone else like to speak on this? Councillor Ward. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Ian, for bringing this forward. Last weekend was yet another successful remembrance occasion. The numbers who attend grow every year, and that's really brilliant to see. Uh, there is a growing appreciation of the armed forces. Um, they, they, have, they are more visible now with various wars going on around the world. And, and you may think they have nothing to do with us. Ian and I will tell you they have everything to do with us. You may not know about it. It's as simple as that. Um, it would be great if the Isle of Wight Council did something visible for the armed forces and, and the veterans. They are a growing community and it, it, was, it would be great if we could actually support them. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone, anyone else like to make any comments before we come to Stevens? Thank you. I'm going to t put a bit of a um, touch of reality with this because we're being asked for uh, support and land hire charges to be waived, etc. I've got no problem with that, but then you will find that we will get a carnival committee, a, a street fair, shall we say in Bembridge or wherever, that doesn't want to pay for road closures and um, other bits and pieces. I don't know, without without assessing uh, the elements of uh, financial outlay. Um, Chair, is, can I just interrupt no, you, you on a personal I explanation? I given way. No, please. Councillor Stevens, I believe please, I can. Not. This was clearly you outlined at the top of the motion. Sure, you this is at the end to um, back to discussion anything. about funding. Come, it's a consideration for everybody to discuss. Come back at the end. I think because if you mentioned Steve land finish this point first. Thank you. And I just want to say that, you know, be aware of what we've got at the Isle of Wight Council is something that we've, we've got to look at. Fully support you, uh, Councillor Dorr and uh, Councillor Ward. You know I do. When the when the uh, Armed Force Covenant was first come to the Isle of Wight, I passed it straight to uh, uh, Councillor Ward as an ex as as ex military. I was the uh, Isle of Wight uh, president of the um, Royal British Legion at the time. I've been involved with um, Armed Forces Day, support it wholly. But what we've got to look at is that there are hundreds of charities on this island that go out and work tirelessly to gain some funding to transport people uh, across the island to get to their hospital appointments all the bits and pieces that that go together now be aware of what we're doing i'm not i don't want to sully this with finance but if we're not careful that's the road we're going to go down will he support you count councillor door with with what you're bringing forward Absolutely, and with 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 what I've done in the past, and uh, the uh, veterans that know me and know me well, they would understand my viewpoint. As with the rest of the Isle of Wight, with regards to talking about what we can do and what we can't do, especially coming up to budget, where where we're looking at, um, where we've also looked at, uh, can I say, crafting or or uh, right sizing this organization to take things forward we have to make sure that uh, the cost in the cost to uh, individuals in this council who've left this council um need to be taken into consideration as much as our support for um armed forces day 
fully support all the all the, all the uh, veterans charities and fully fully support all the veterans associations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, I've got Councillor Lilly. I fully support this, but and I just really wanted to add that over the last few years, um, you've actually had incredible courage and bravery of veterans coming forward about their mental health, right? And their need of the, their support and have brought, you know, the public uh, to notice that actually a large amount of uh, men on this island particularly do commit suicide uh, annually and the highest group in that are actually former veterans. The issue of homelessness uh, again is, is often veterans and in fact the Veterans Hotel which is a very much community initiative of veterans supporting veterans actually at this moment has four homeless veterans uh, living there and supported by them. And the Veterans Hub on the High Street in Ride daily supports uh, veterans of all ages. So we have a very strong tradition of veterans supporting themselves and what this day does and what Councillor Dawes says is it helps them to profile the good work that they do and helps them get uh, the funding and finance and I think it's important it was very good to see the Veterans Hotel on the one show about um, a, a couple of months ago and it not only brought their issue it actually showed uh, the Isle of Wight in terribly good light of that and many veterans now come to the island to visit and to get respite. Thank you. Councillor Fuller. Thank you Chairman. Um, the Isle of Wight has more veterans per head of population than anywhere else in the UK. They are a huge body of people on the island. Now within my work that I've undertaken with the Footprint Trust, we know that there are a lot of veterans that don't necessarily go to the Royal British Legion or the numerous other charities that there are out there to support veterans. A lot of the people that you talk to, and Michael is absolutely right, they have mental health issues, they need support. They're not the prior proudest of people to ask for support. And there are so many people that fall through our uh, through fall through the safety net. So I'm very, very happy and I would be very, very proud to support Councillor Dawes' um, uh, motion uh, before us tonight. I think it's well needed and I certainly will give um, my full support towards it. And thank you to Ian and Ian and Ian for their work with the, um, with the veterans that we have many of on the island. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ward. Thank you, Chair, for letting me speak again. Um, three Ian's. Mm, that must be unique. <laughs> um, Councillor Stevens's um, fears are fully justified. You know, you can't argue against that. The council will come under pressure to, from various other councils and bodies to say, well, if you give it to them, you know, why don't you give it to us? But I have the perfect answer for members. The Armed Forces Government is a government direction. It's not a choice. We are directed to support the armed forces and veterans. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ward. I think it's yes, it's it's about considering this in a in a wider scope. So Councillor Garrett. Thank you, Chair. Um Councillor Stevens makes very, very good point indeed. And and I can understand his concerns that he we might set a precedent. Well, I wouldn't be afraid of setting that precedent because what high, what a high bar we would be setting. Um, we've heard from Councillor Dorr of what the Armed Forces Day, well, it's more than a day, isn't it? It leads up to that. It, it goes on from that. It works through the the connections it makes, the, the understanding that it can bring, um, the civic engagement, um, 
the help for those with mental health issues and and so on. So if, if, if you came to cabinet with something like this, which was talking in all of those terms and setting out how it benefits community, a, a particular community, but communities beyond those it, on the Isle of Wight, you would have a set of criteria which you would you would be very clear uh, were satisfied. Um, so yes, Councillor Stevens is quite right to warn us about the financial kind of considerations, but we are sensible enough to know that we can set criteria for that um, based on the high bar, as I, I believe Councillor Dawes' um, motion would would set us for any, for any other community event that uh, that came along and asked us for similar sorts of support. So I, I, I'm wholeheartedly behind Councillor Dore on, on this one. Um, it is a community, um, sadly, that is is growing um, because war is still with us and military engagement is still with us. And the need for a military presence um, drawn from, from this country's citizenry, those, I, 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 I find it extraordinary how people can find that that willingness to place themselves so clearly at, at the forefront of, of service of one's country. Um, and so I hope this will go positively towards actually a budget that does see, see the considerations realise into actual real money. Thank you. Councillor Tall, would you like to come back on your proposal yes. reply? Thank you very much for everybody's uh, interjections and comments this evening. It's greatly, greatly appreciated. When I signed up at 16 and a half, I accepted that at some point I would be put in harm's way and at various points in my career I was, as I'm sure Councillor Ward was. For many, that can be an obstacle when they leave the forces and the Covenant, amongst other things, helps address that through its obligations and aims. It is an incredibly powerful thing to be part of and currently we are at the highest level. When the fire brigade go on strike, who managed the green goddesses? When COVID struck, who helped create an additional 200 beds at St Mary's? When emergency planning need to airlift fire hydrants and what have you in support of flooding or fire, who do they rely on? It's the armed forces. There is never any credit, no recognition. It's simply the job, often above and beyond the call of duty. One of the ways we can say thank you is through Armed Forces Day, something that I hope I've made clear we are obliged to do, as Council Award has reiterated. It's not much to ask. One day celebration out of 365 for not only the veterans, cadets, reservists, families and friends. It is for everybody. It's simply a matter of deciding how much we really value that commitment, morally and yes, financially. Things have changed since 2018 when this was last reassessed. We have to adapt to that change as a supporter. It is within our gift to make a positive difference. Now, there is a phrase that is used in the previous committee's minutes that well, frankly, it repulses me. It's simply, we'll send out begging letters. In support of our armed forces community, I find that unacceptable, that we as a stakeholder should ever have to beg for such support. This year's event was absolutely corking. We had 150 veterans all fed and watered, as well as the reserves and the cadets. There was an uplift in charity donations for the charities that work here on the island, Voss, Safa, um, and various others. There's also a massive feel-good factor too. In the town itself, the amenities were full, and this consideration is one of the keys to making it sustainable so it can grow, the legacy of which will be a continue, continued demonstration of value and worth. I mean, tonight we have one of the, 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 the goddaughters of one of the pioneers of aviation in this very room. The Isle of Wight Council are signatories of the Armed Forces Covenant. In that document signed on the 14th of June last year, a commitment was made to support Armed Forces Day. It's in section two, national events, if you really fancy some bedtime reading. We are obliged. It's reaffirmed as Council Award has mentioned in the MOD document. Next year is the 80th anniversary of D-Day, and so it carries more significance and relevance for right here on our very doorstep, troops, equipment and craft were prepped for the invasion. On the 5th, they were assembled off the island and on the 6th, they were gone. Mere miles from where we sit right now. It's incredible. 
Now, as a father, a very proud father, bringing up two little girls and trying to get on just like everybody else, I completely, Councillor Stevens, understand and appreciate the budgetary restraints that we have upon us. But so do the 16,000 of the island's armed forces community. Yet on occasion, some of them have paid a much higher price. By reassessing and reaffirming our commitment, bringing it up to what is appropriate for 2023, I don't think it's asking too much. So I ask not what the Islands Armed Forces community can do for you, but what you can do for them. It's time to dare and endure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Dorr. Um, in this position, I have come to see quite a lot of the Armed Forces parades and community and the recognition is very much appreciated by them at last year's event. And I would obviously like to see that continue and grow bigger. So um, as we have this motion on the table, I propose that we go to the votes on this now, unless there's anyone else. And um, those in favour of this motion, please raise your hand. And those against, and anyone want to abstain? No, that motion is carried, thank you. Now on to item nine, members question time the leader or of the cabinet. So have I got members question? Councillor Jarman. Sorry Chair, I was just giving uh, people a chance to write down names of other hands that were racing up around me. Uh, so my question this evening is to the leader. Uh, given a recent request uh, to the chair and the monitoring officer for an agenda item to be added to our meeting this evening was rejected, even though it was submitted in advance of the draft agenda being produced by the monitoring officer for review by the chair. Will the leader ask the monitoring officer to confirm to this full council meeting this evening, what is the process defined in our constitution for members to maintain control of the agenda for our full council meetings? What is the process for members to submit agenda items for the same? What is the decision process for their acceptance or rejection? And what is the time limit, if any, for said submissions? Thank you. I'm happy to ask the monitoring officer that uh, directly. Uh, I can't remember all of the questions though, Chris. Um, would you want to ask them again directly to the monitoring officer? Yes, uh, the first part is, uh, what is the process for, uh, the first part, which is material, is what is the process in the constitution for members to submit agenda items, not motions, agenda items uh, for our meeting? Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Jarman. Uh, I think it's, it's one of these matters which, uh, I won't beat around the bush, it needs improvement mm. um, because obviously there are fundamental democratic implications in terms of uh, any individual councillor putting forward an agenda on full council gen agenda paper, just as indeed there are uh, rights in relation to other committees such as overview and scrutiny. Um, so I think the detail does need to be um, set out there so that any member knows what the timescales would be, because there aren't any specific. Uh, and, and that's why I think we ought to be frank about that and say, look, this is a matter which does need the engagement with all members uh, as to uh, how it's appropriately dealt with by revision to the constitution. Um, there is uh, some old case law, uh, which, uh, demonstrated where councillors can go astray when they do set uh, standing orders in relation to uh, things going on agendas, because sometimes uh, councillors can make decisions that, you know, in order for something to go on agenda, you would need X number of other councillors to support you, etc. And I can't remember the, the name of a specific case offhand, but the general gist of it was that it was held to be illegal by that particular council because they'd failed to engage with the issue in terms of democratic implications. I think it's a matter which Council Brody has sort of uh, mentioned a number of times in the chamber, because obviously 
when a council, for example, is, is uh, uh, non-aligned, then you know if, if one was to arbitrarily impose some you know, four or five members needed to you know, supplement uh, uh, a request for somebody to go on the agenda, then individual councils might be disenfranchised uh, and obviously democracy probably would suffer as a result. So um, in terms of the specific request, obviously the agenda had to be put in draft uh, and in order for things to uh, gain proper consideration, there's a, a certain lead in time to make sure it's going to be um, information put in front of all members appropriately. But I'm pleased you've raised it because um, it is a matter which, uh, you know, does need dealing with. And it's, it's a fundamental matter. And I'm surprised it hasn't been um, ironed out in the past. Um, and it's something which we can add to the, uh, what I call the snagging list, etc. And I think Councillor Brodie would might want to come in, Chair. Board and Chair, I think we're straying very much into a, a question to an officer rather than the leader or, or, or members of the cabinet. Uh, I would advise Councillor Jarman to pursue this with the monitoring officer and, and his line management if necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Brodie. Um, Councillor Jarman, are you happy with that, that answer? And do you have a supplementary? No, Chair, I, th I think we've got the answer that it's, it is, it's not dealt with in the Constitution, that nobody could find it. And uh, I, I would suggest to the leader that uh, we, we leave this as an issue to the revision of the Constitution, which we all believe may be imminently pending uh, following perhaps our meeting in January. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jarman. Uh, Councillor Brodie. It's a question for the leader and lead member for highways, transport and all the rest of it. I can't remember your full <laughs> and extensive title. Could you could you ex could you just tell me, the council and the island public, how island rogues are performing against their milestones in the PFI contract? Thank you. Uh, um, so uh, the the word milestones is interesting because it has a contractual implication, uh, and there were fourteen of them. There were two per year for the first seven years of the co what was termed the core investment period, um, and uh, that was for seven years. After which uh, there were eighteen years, which we are now in of maintenance after we had achieved during the seven years um, an upgrade of our highways network um, and uh, each of those milestones needed signing off uh, during the period of the seven years and the last <clears throat> milestone was therefore milestone 14 uh, which was the end of the seven year period two a year seven years 14. Um, that was signed off now forgive me if i get the date exactly uh, uh not exactly right but around 2021 uh now well it uh, the, the seven years so so the the last milestone milestone 14 would have ended in march 2020 uh, there were some issues, uh, and that was resolved about a year later, milestone 14. So in terms of milestone achievement, in a contractual sense, those, uh, those milestones have been met. Supplementary, please, Chair. Can I add, in your view, are Island Rogues performing to the standard that we as a council and the residents of the Isle of Wight should be expecting. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeff. And um, it would be fair to say that there are some disagreements between ourselves and the contractual provider on the levels of service that are being provided for the money that we are paying. Uh, and those are ongoing discussions. Uh, and um, we're doing as much as we can 
as quickly as we can to ensure that this island and this council and our public are getting what we pay for, Jeff. Councillor Lilly next. Thank you. Um, a question to the leader. Um, Isle of Wight Council st still has over one million pounds invested in PTAC, a proposed tidal energy project off Ventnor, which is licensed offshore and has planning permission. Uh, sorry, on offshore and has planning permission onshore. Is this project still viable? And what is current? What is the current position? Thank you, Michael. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm being informed that that isn't the current, potentially not the current position. Uh, I was around in 2013 when this first uh, arrived to the, in, in this council. I remember over the summer, it was when Councillor Stevens was leader, um, and it was one of the first major decisions uh, that we had to take as the then uh, independent administration. Around, Ju around July or August uh, to invest some money into the project. At the time, we were being in, uh, encouraged to invest to acquire the licenses from the Crown agents to carry out the works that required in the project. And we did eventually invest that money and acquire those licenses. I'm being informed that the project has changed somewhat uh, and that it may not be the case that our money is invested in the project in this way. Yeah, yeah, but but we're hap I'm happy to give you a written response, Michael, on that because I'm I'm straying into trying to give you answers that I, I'd like to be more sure of um, as, as as much as I'm trying to give you an answer here for everyone to hear. Uh, that pl please let me give you a, a written answer for more information than I've just given you. Councillor Lilly, do you have a supplementary? I'm I'm happy for that, but I would request that that information goes to all members of the council in in reply, because it's nearly ten years, right, uh, regarding a project, and we need uh, renewable energy projects, and uh, you know tidal wave could actually be significant to this island. So it's very sad that these things just go very quiet. Thank you. Thank you. I do have a question, but I'm going to hand over to Councillor Oliver because I know his question is more important than my question. So if that's OK, we're, we've only got 30 minutes, haven't we, of this? Yep, I can go to Councillor Oliver next. I feel honoured, I have to be honest. Um, my, my question to the, to the leader is, uh, Newport Health Centre currently operates over two sites since their practice is merged in 2019. They have 24,000 patients on their books. They're currently bursting at the seams with their current two sites and have been attempting to work with the council for over three years to establish an alternative location. The lack of an appropriate site is at huge risk of causing health inequalities as the practice struggles to fit the services it needs. Can you commit to meeting with and supporting the practice to obtain the only viable site identified, which I believe is Godrick Road? Thank you. I absolutely commit to meeting uh, and will commit to any uh, any approaches to me on any subject, on any issue. I will meet with those people and discuss it. Uh, so absolutely commit to that. In fact, I have I have met with them already, but I'm happy to meet again. Uh, can I just say, sorry, Jeff, uh, um, uh, just in general uh, terms, as Michael raised that, if we provide a written response, it will go to all members. That, that that just makes sense. Thank you. Do you want to speak on that subject? Yeah, no, I do. I, th I think I don't know if I need to, but the declaration of interest because Councillor Oliver raises uh, uh, the surgery in which I'm a patient, and I suspect uh, other Newport councillors are also patients there. We are seriously concerned about that practice's premises. It's affecting the healthcare that people are receiving. Certainly affecting my healthcare, and I probably need to just declare. Uh, whatever it is, uh, a personal but non prejudicial interest. Thank you. Thank you. Share, share your concerns. Um, we have similar uh, issues in Ryde. Um, 
uh, and absolutely committed to trying to find a solution for this. It's important for your community, for, for the island, and uh, we'll do what we can to find a solution to that. Absolutely committed to that. Councillor Oliver, did you have a supplementary? No. I'll come to Councillor Garrett next. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. Um, the Leader of the Council will know that uh, I've welcomed um, his approach to attempting to, for, to foment uh, greater cross-chamber working, and certainly one of those areas is on, on the budget. The Liberal Democrat group is very happy to engage with the administration. Though I, I wonder either he or whether the, the lead member could, though, give a commitment to, or get, have, the, have, have you given further consideration to giving a commitment to bringing any indicative savings, not just to the attention of all groups of this council to consider, but to members of the public and stakeholders so that they might give a meaningful response to those before we get to a situation where they're pretty much cast iron in the budget. Uh, I'm sure uh, Councillor Stevens will also uh, add to this, uh, Andrew. Um, it, it is it is difficult to it to uh, as you're going through a process of setting a budget with moving numbers. You know that's what we move the numbers about. Uh, um, to arrive at a legal lawful budget, to then share that as you're doing it, um, particularly with the public in the process, you need to be open and transparent. But during that process, when changes can be made, things brought in and things taken out, uh, once you've told the public that these things are under consideration uh, and they may not be under consideration in the final analysis, I think we, we're at risk of um, uh, exposing the position of the budget uh, at the wrong moment. Uh, I'm very, very clear about, and obviously it's a public document anyway, that when we set the budget, it's here in this chamber, in this room, the press are there and the public can be upstairs and 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 the budget is then public. I, I, I'm finding it difficult to see at what point before that um, we release information publicly. The offer to to which you've taken up, and I thank you for that, Andrew, uh, along with Richard and Jeff, uh, to help us set this budget. It's it's a tough time again. We know that. Uh, it's come every year for the last 13 years, um, but we need to do it. We can do it. We will do it. Um, and your help is much appreciated, Andrew, uh, as is Richard and, 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 and Jeff's. Um, at what point you, in that process, of, are confident that we are getting close to a budget that we can bring to this full council might be a moment that we could uh, talk about expanding that. The offer's still open to other people in this chamber, to other councillors, uh, to the EI group and to, and to um, Conservatives. If they want to come on board and help us with this budget, be happy to see them alongside us. I'm sure Councillor Stevens has a view on this as well. I have uh, leader, but what I would say is I don't want to I don't want to waste up too much time. I think you've adequately summed it up that whilst we're in the whilst we're in a process of taking things forward and uh, looking at various options, we should be looking at the various options without setting the hairs running elsewhere. And I think that that's that's good. What I will say and what I have committed to and you have uh, leader is that we will commit to giving the information that that we that we get and we think is, um, uh, you know, uh, how can I say, adequate and uh, fulfills the opportunity to come out with a with a good legal, fully uh, balanced budget with a hell of a lot of feeling and hopefully some softening elements within it so that we don't, it's not all uh, grab, grab, grab and uh, uh, diminishing areas of service. We want to actually try and put a, a a rounded budget as well as a legal and balanced budget. I'll leave it at that, but obviously, echoing what you've said, um, our colleagues across the, the chamber fully uh, fully welcome to come along and have a discussion and what have you. The same with um, EI as well. You know, we're, um, we've committed to being open and uh, transparent about these things and uh, we'll continue to do so. But I do thank, and I would say this, because uh, but Andrew, Richard and uh, Jeff have come on board 
and added value to this process. And I'll make sure that, that all the information uh, that I get, they get. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevens. Uh, Councillor Moster has waited patiently. Now it's her turn. Uh, thank you. Um, this is actually a question that Councillor Jarman asked the other day at scrutiny, but I feel that I really need to reiterate the, the question here because I'm in a situation at the moment that this, if taken up, would actually help me at the moment because I asked a question at scrutiny and I feel that I've got to go through the tapes to get the exact detail because I asked it as a member's question. Um, will the Cabinet Member for Democratic Services confirm that all public and member questions asked at full council and all other public access committees, whether in advance writing or verbally, and their answers in full will be recorded and attached to the respective minutes on the Isle of Wight Council's website and read out at the subsequent respective meetings so that all members and public have access to questions and answers to ensure that the answers given are subject to disclosure and scrutiny. Um, just to put this in context, I asked a member's question at scrutiny um, and that won't be in full as part of the minutes in the current system that we run. So I have actually got something else to ask at the next scrutiny, but I'm going to have to go past because it was a member's question, not actually as part of the committee. So it would be really helpful if this could be taken on board, at least by scrutiny, you know, different chairs. Um, I don't know what Councillor Robertson thinks of that and it's to the leader really, but it would be really helpful in the future if that could be taken on board. Um, thank you for that. As I understand it, the, the question is asking if all member questions, or indeed all questions asked, can be recorded in full and the answers recorded in full. Um, I don't fundamentally see a problem with that. I'm just looking at uh, the last full council and see there is a summary there of questions and answers. Um, I suspect I will need to have a word with democratic services just to see if any issue arises because normally minutes are not a verbatim record of course um, so there might just be an issue there but I'll certainly undertake to look at that and see if it is um, practically possible and if so it would seem a wholly sensible suggestion. Is there a reason why it's not done as standard already is that what you're finding out? Because, yeah, as a fairly new councillor, these things coming up tonight that have obviously... Yeah, I, I think, Chair, that the, 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 the issue is that minutes, as we all know, do not gen are not a verbatim record of any meeting. Um, we will see that in the minutes we have in front of us at our last meeting, and indeed any set of minutes uh, that uh, we uh, receive as members of the Council. The question is to aid ongoing debate, as I understand, whether that element of meetings for councillors' assistance can be a verbatim record. There will be a, 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 a time and resource implication in that, but it does seem a sensible move. So I'm, I'm happy to say I'm not going to commit to it because that might, there might be an element of impracticality, but certainly if it is practically possible, um, and this is a call on the, the, the skills of democratic services staff, then uh, it would it would seem to be a wise move because it would support our ability to look back and say, well, what was the precise wording in that question? What was the precise answer? I, I can see that absolutely. I'm just being a little bit cautious because it does require officers to be able to record things absolutely word for word be for that to work. Are pre-submitted questions, do you have that in those committees? And are they done word for word? already but it's just not ones that are asked on the note okay do i understand that procedure okay just to add uh, my understanding will happily be corrected my understanding is just these recorded that these meetings are recorded uh, and therefore I, i'm sure i've clicked on these in on the isle of white council website on the meetings where, where where you can access the actual recording of the meeting Jordan, I completely get that, but to be fair, I asked a question at scrutiny and I'm going to have to go past the actual recording, whereas you know yourself if you're on your computer and you just go a sentence, you'll actually be able to look up on a document and quickly get to what you're looking for rather than sitting through the whole of scrutiny again, you know, just to find out to the point, stopping and pausing it, that I asked the question to get the response. So if it was actually in writing, that would be a lot easier that it's recorded in that way. 
let, let's have a look at that, Claire. And uh, if it's not too resource uh, hugging, uh, we'll, 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 we'll have a look at getting that done. Uh, I, I agree with the spirit of it, of course. I've got Councillor Adams next. I'd like to ask a question for our colleague, John Medland. Will the Leader permit Alliance members to participate in a cross-party effort to prepare a formal submission to a future full council meeting on strategic options for long-term sustainability of the A3055 military road? If so, please would those members that wish to participate make those selves known to Councillor Medland or Councillor Price after this meeting? Mr Jordan? Uh, th th thank you for that. And and um, to to explain that uh, this is uh, two sites on the military road that are close to the coast, uh, closer than they've been in their history. Um, there are complications with, with this. Uh, one of them is that it's a contractual obligation uh, by our contract. A contractual provider to find a solution for what's called Site 14, which is Brook. Um, and I, I'm not sure what councillors can bring to that contractual obligation to find a solution. Um, the second part of the complexity, uh, and we have had a number of meetings, and, and Councillor Stewart has certainly been at one of them, uh, is that there are extensive com complex land ownership issues and interests uh, to resolve uh, before uh, an alternative road, if that were the solution, could be considered. M my suggestions is that would be an largely an officer-led uh, operation to find out what is possible if a road reroute was a solution. But currently, as we speak, the solution is, is being presented to us by the contractual provider under contractual obligations. So I'm not sure that I can commit at this stage to creating a further working group. What I would be, and in fact, Councillor Medlin was invited to the last meeting, which included all of the stakeholders, all of the landowners, the Environment Agency, the DFT, the Department for Transport, was at meeting councillors uh, and our officers, Island Roads were there. It, it was quite a large meeting. Uh, 20, 25 people were at it. Councillor Medlin didn't attend. He might have been ill or unable, but he was certainly invited. I, I would I would say that we would recreate those kinds of meetings as we move forward. And once we've seen what the solution is from Island Roads, uh, and I hope that's helpful um, at this stage for Councillor Medland. Sorry, can I ask a supplementary to that, please? Well, can I, I just think... ask a question? Because I know Matt's at the end waving his hand and I'm sure he wants to be involved in those meetings. Is that the question, Matt? I had already asked Matt subconsciously over there if he wanted to speak and he said no, but I will give him the option to speak again. Do not worry. Um, thank you. So I, I, I know it sort of changes the normal process by me coming in at this stage, but, um, you know, I, I was happy to be included in that request because um, of the decision made at the last planning committee. Um, and uh, the, the concern, um, and I know the, the public have raised lots of concerns that, um, that that proposal, while not being the best solution, it's the only solution. Um, and in absence of another solution coming forward anytime soon, um, and the repeatedly bad weather we're seeing, um, you know, that road is at risk of failure probably sooner rather than later. And, um, you know, while we have all those 25 people in a meeting that probably have all got a different opinion. Um, there's a solution, a contractual solution offered already. Now, there were very many reasons to reject it, but there were equally just as many reasons to accept it. Um, and, and I think the idea of a working group would be to explore and push on all those other options and continue pushing those other agencies. And I say this um, not wanting to stand on any other councillor's toes, because obviously I represent an area of Newport and Whippingham, not the military road. Um, but I, my inclusion was because of the decision 
um, made at the planning committee. Um, and there were good reasons to turn that down. But there, like I say, there were equally good reasons to um, to approve it. Um, and um, and I think, you know, we may be faced with a, a situation where that refusal leads to a permanent closure of that road in the not too distant future. And I think the working group, um, to whatever ever its extent, and, and who is on that working group, it would keep the door open to negotiations. If those negotiations fail and there's no other alternative, then that first solution that we've already considered could come back and be back on the table. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Matt. Um, just for absolute clarity, uh, the solution that you are referring to, which came to planning and was rejected, is not the solution that the contractor is working on now. Uh, and that's because, as I said, there is a contractual obligation to find a solution. And as far as they are concerned at this moment in time, that is not deliverable because of the planning decision. So we are expecting, and I know that they're working on another solution. Can I just add also that this week, um, a well-known uh, uh, professor, uh, who is known to some of us councillors, uh, has uh, contacted me with offers of uh, free help on the scheme at Brook uh, and how we could find a solution without rerouting the road uh, and how we could uh, ensure that the military road is safe for a very, very good manager. And I'm, and, and I'm intending to meet him very shortly in the next week or two. So there are numbers of things going on. I'm afraid that's the end of members' questions and um, that's the end of our meeting. So if you save those that didn't get to ask, save it for next time. And thank you very much for attending. All those in the gallery and online, thank you. Good night. <laughs>